All right, good morning. Welcome to uh, the five best WordPress themes. No. <laughs> Just checking to see if you're awake this morning. This is uh, do-it-yourself continuous integration. Uh, very excited to have a whole uh, room here. Uh, a little bit about me. Uh, I am a recovering developer, so I do get distracted easily, like shiny things in code, you know, like uh, like really like launching into long descriptions about hierarchies or object references, um, which kind of conflicts with the next one of project manager of trying to keep things on track. Uh, I'm a scrum master. Uh, I've done development on my own, so I have a um, um, fair background in actually coding, uh, and I am the CTO for Promet Source, which is really where um, I really became passionate about this subject of uh, continuous development. And uh, the reason for that is I have a team that I manage uh, 25 developers across three continents. We have people working all over, committing. Um, we have project teams that are anywhere from, you know, the typical Drupal development that's kind of... Uh, one or two people working to projects where I have like 10 or 15 people working on a project or even worse, uh, you know, we're working with our partners and there may be multiple development teams working on a project. So, you know, not only do I need to manage mine, I need to manage, you know, what is the client doing? Um, what is our team doing? Um, so when, when you're working with Drupal, uh, I want to, uh, like give us something to work with. Is anyone here familiar with Katamari? The game? So this is a game where you have a big ball that rolls down the hill and kills you. Um, so with Drupal, there's a, a concept that I think is, is actually wrong, is that a Drupal is like, I want to launch my Drupal and I have a snapshot of that, that Drupal in Get or in my source control and that is my application at one time. And that's, that's the vision of Drupal as a monolithic delivery. When what Drupal really is, Drupal is this amalgamation of things. You know, it's, it's we've got our code, we've got our configuration, we've got modules, and hey, guess what? You know, we do projects where I have back-end integrations, so not only do I have Drupal, I also ha have custom code libraries. So maybe I'm managing some SOAP library, maybe I'm managing an integration to, um, um, to auth.net, maybe it's in, uh, maybe I'm calling some web services, so I have a whole combination of these things, and if we like get a little bit deeper, when I have uh, sites in production, uh, I also have content to deal with. So uh, this kind of cre creates the rolling bottle of crud that rolls over the top of you. It's when all those things meet that uh, we get into issues. Um, so I can kind of structure, I, I didn't do something at the beginning, so, so I can kind of structure this. I'd like to kind of take an inventory of who we have in the room. So uh, just show of hands, like developers, pretty much everyone, project managers, yeah, you are the guys that really should be listening. Like, these are, these are the people we have to convince, okay? Um, business owners? All right. Anyone, uh, like, uh, that is buying Drupal or, like, use Drupal in the organization, like, client type? Okay, so it's just us Drupal folks. Um, so Why? Uh, you know, I already talked about we have distributed teams, uh, and I need to get these teams to work faster. So the, the thing that has been, uh, you know, coming from like a C-sharp background or Java background, you know, I'm used to things that are very encapsulated. So, you know, you can be coding something, she can be coding something, you know, someone there back, you know, and these things don't necessarily like step on each other. And the great thing about Drupal is, I can write a hook, and I can affect anything in the program anywhere else. And the horrible thing about Drupal is 
you know, I can ride a hook and I can affect anything anywhere else. So when we all get to merging that stuff together, um, the classic Drupal uh, conundrum is uh, I'm launching something into production. There's a site that's already UAT. It's already approved. We've written a hook. Something changed, and that changes in the in the site, and we don't know it till it gets to production. So the real reason I, I'm very interested in CI is I just don't like those surprises in production. In order to solve that, the other issue is uh, the way that we were doing this at ProMed is we had QA. So everyone likes just like having that big Excel sheet with all the check boxes on it about you know, I went to this page, I clicked on this item, and this thing happened. And then, you know, I really like the different uh, user scenarios. So like, you know, this flow works as I'm this type of user, but for a different user, we're going to present them a different page. So QA becomes, on larger projects, becomes an exhausting event. Um, and usually, go ahead. And you're not talking about QA being integrated into that continuous integration problem? I am. I am. I'm talking about why do we want continuous integration. Uh, I'm kind of like wanting to set the stage for, um, like, what, what, are we, what are we trying to address with continuous integration? Um, you know, kind of what are the problems that, that you have? So, you know, the problems that you have are, you know, trying to get all these people to work together, trying to get all of our code to mesh together correctly. Uh, you know, we want to work fast, but, you know, last night I had 10 people working on the project, so uh, 10 people times 8 hours is 80 hours of work. That's going to be a lot of code, that's going to be a lot of merging. You know, I'm sure everyone's experts at Git, so there's going to be no merge conflicts. <laughs> Um, you know, and then once, you know, since we don't have any merge conflicts, then all we have left is just testing, like, you know, did we get the functionality right? Um, and I'm sure we all have, like, uh, you know, if you're not using continuous integration, I'm sure you have really good use cases and really good test plans that are lockstep hand in hand. Uh, that's not the way life really happens as I experience it. Um, so what we've defined, um, so what I'm going to do is uh, today I'm going to talk about continuous integration. I'm going to talk about the way we do it at ProMet. I'm going to give you the resources that we use for ProMet. Um, I am working on a box that already has, uh, we use Vagrant. I do not have the Vagrant box ready today that I can just distribute to everyone and say go run this box. Here's what's set up, but if you will email me, I should have that in the next week. Um, and part of that reason is, is everyone's workflow is a little bit different. So we use Vagrant. We like Chef. Uh, we have a specific Git workflow that we use. Uh, I'm going to bet if we ask everyone in here, everyone has a slightly different flavor of how they work. Um, there's also some testing in uh, CI servers. Um, so you can use Travis, you can use, um, what is that, Lassian Bamboo, um, you can use Jenkins, uh, really doesn't matter. <coughs> what you need to do is we need to think about continu continuous integration uh, and what we're, um, how to implement it for each one of you. So uh, what is it? <coughs> um, so continuous integration is smashing all these be bits of code together uh, in one place. Uh, and there's some components that go into that that make uh, continuous integration. Uh, we do not have all of these. It's a work in progress. I promise you, if any of you are doing these, that you are at different stages here and you may be doing all of it. Or, or none of it. Uh, one question I didn't ask, is anyone using any sort of continuous integration right now? What, just quick, Jenkins? Jenkins? Jenkins. Who says it? Okay. Jenkins. <laughs> All right, so Jenkins, and I believe that Travis is actually, like, is, is built on top of Jenkins, so, um, 
and Lisa has seen this presentation before, so we, we actually have, um, in the last uh, two weeks, we've set up uh, Jenkins in-house and are running this. So the really key part of continuous integration, so we want to smash the bits together, uh, revision control. I think the, the Drupal standard is get. Is anyone not using get? Yeah. I don't know why, but we're using it again. Okay. Uh, I'm an old guy, so I like SVN, <laughs> like I can set up my trunk folder, you know, like main, like you and I can talk, like, you know, that's, that's where I, I uh, got started with the revision control. Git is better. Um, build automation. So, um, you know, as a project manager, uh, one of the favorite things I like to do to harass the developers before we got CI is to ask, like, is that built on, on dev yet? And then if I got that, it'd be like, well, is that what built on staging? You know, so that's a real fun conversation you can have. It also adds um, friction or viscosity to your project in that uh, if I don't know what's built, if different team members don't know what's built and what's working, um, I don't know if my code's going to work or not. Like, I can't see it's working. Project managers, stakeholders, those kind of folks can't see what's going. Um, so um, you need some type of build automation. Um, automated deployments. So uh, started in Drupal in like uh, D6 days. Did lots of schlepping of um, FTP files around onto the server. It was really great fun. Um, different versions of the database, moving those. Um, you need some way that when you go from dev or local to dev to staging to prod, that that's automated and every time that's done in the same way. Um, one of the things we do is uh, as developers, our team is very committed to all of our configuration changes are in features. So if you're a developer, you don't move, um, we don't ever move the database. Uh, you're going to take your code, you're going to create fe features in the branch you're working. Um, if it is something like menus don't play really nice with features, um, so we wind up doing those as uh, update hooks, uh, menu blocks for some reason, just um, the way you have to create the Sometimes they're built out of, a, out of a taxonomy and it's the order of, of events causes that. So uh, to automate deployment, what happens is those changes are built in always in code. And then at each stage of development, uh, that deployment is done with a build script. Uh, Going to spend a fair amount of time later talking about uh, self-testing build. This is the part where we want to get rid of... Uh, really want to get rid of QA testing. Uh, you know, computers are great at doing automated tests. If I want to see that a label is on a page, why don't I have some way to just do that and enforce it? Um, testing of a clone of production, um, really core code consolidation, um, frequent commits, the, these all go together. These all kind of like add up to, to one Item. So, like, if you have everything in build control, you've automated the build, um, you have your test there, you're doing code consolidation. Frequent commits is more like a programmer or developer uh, housekeeping skill. So, um, everyone here has, like, gotten the, uh, the monolithic commit where, like, a developer goes into a room, they've worked for, like, a week, there's, like, four modules, you know, there's a thousand lines of codes, there's some CSS hacks, uh, and they all kind of come in at one time, and you're like, well, this doesn't work, and then you have a big, a big... Uh, you get the, well, it works on my locals. <laughs> right. You know, and, and better than that, when you're trying to fix that problem, you don't have a way to easily go back in your source control and say, 
oh, look, these are very atomic small commits. I can see where we worked on one very small item. You know, let's, let's do some get foo and move that back out and see if that happens to it. Um, it is valid to ask me how you, you get to that. Um, part of that is we do, um, no one in our company is allowed to merge their own code. And we have a group chat across the company um, where you have to ask for someone else to review your code. Uh, in addition to that, the solutions architect or whoever's in charge of the project, um, he's going to throw up a flag if he doesn't see a commit from someone at least at the end of every day. So we do uh, work in process commits, uh, daily commits. I'd really like to see, I really want to see more than daily commits. I really want to see like ticket level commits, uh, four items, or even sometimes I will get uh, with some of the better teams, I'll get like, you know, I have this ticket, but this is really four different things. Can we break that up so we can see it? That allows you to actually go back and consolidate that code and back it out. Uh, build availability is really related to build automation. So if you're have an automated build, then I can do this build every day. I can do that build every time there's a merge pull request. Um, and then I need to be able to see what those tests are. So um, everybody kind of with me so far? We're drinking the Kool-Aid, life's good. Um, um, so the way we have put this together is these are the set of tools that we use. Um, I am going to bet uh, for all the people here that are using some automated build, you know, we're probably using some of the same tools. We are probably not using them in the same way. Um, we use Vagrant. Um, so each project, as we build that, Vagrant is a tool for everyone. How many people have used Vagrant or know what it is? So Vagrant is a tool for managing virtual machines. It allows you to build a box um, for a project. Uh, what we do, rather than versioning just the Drupal for a project, is we version a Vagrant box for that box, for that installation, because um, I have about 200 sites as a company that we're responsible for support or for active development. And I think uh, they're not all on the same platform. Believe it or not, they do not all use the same version of Linux. They do not all have the same version of PHP. They do not have the same modules on PHP enabled. Uh, so, you know, really fun facts, you know, like if you, real life, you know, if you develop in 5.4 and you go to deploy it on a site that is 5.3, your code is likely not to work. Um, and you will get, uh, it works great on my box. You know, so what Vagrant allows us to do, Vagrant allows us to deploy a development environment for every project to any developer across the company with a machine that is configured like the production environment. Um, recently had to do a project on Oracle Linux, a very popular distribution, I'm sure everyone uses it. Uh, it's very security centric, very corporate, uh, but it's different. So we built a Vagrant box that has Oracle Linux on it. Um, so any developer that's working in there, when you're working, you're going to get uh, the same problems you would have on production. You're having to work to the same code. Um, we use Vagrant with the Drupal cookbook for Chef. Uh, for custom libraries, we use PHP unit. So like I was talking, we do a lot of um, back-end integrations. So um, integrated to an e-commerce system that's um, .NET based, uses like a self-generated WSDL that's an entire library. So, um, you know, simple test is not going to work for it. Um, Behat doesn't work because it's all back-end. So we use PHP unit for that testing. We use Jenkins. Um, we use Drush to sync and deploy sites. Uh, Headless Selenium, um, Headless Selenium, Phantom JS work with Behat. 
uh, there for testing from a browser. So things like um, I want to be on a page and click into a field. Uh, you need something to automate uh, the browser. Especially if you've got JavaScript going on. Right. Sure. Well, what is Bahat? Bahat is a testing framework. Uh, I'll be showing some a demonstration of that. It's a very English language based uh, testing platform. Uh, there's an extension for it for Drupal. Um, and Bahat is really the part that I think is the most sexy of continuous integration um, that we've done at all. So <coughs> it's a really good segue into uh, a demonstration here. So let me Okay, so that is You know what I need to I can't see it from over here, so give me a moment to duplicate my screen. All right, so our problem, our issue is um, how to get started on this. So I've got the infrastructure. I've got, I've got the uh, vagrant boxes. I've got uh, build scripts that are automated for building my scripts. So what we have inside of the vagrant boxes is when we go to, we go to build, um, whenever I'm building an environment, those environment variables are built uh, if I want to install a Drupal, um, we have uh, a variable for local dev staging prod. And the reason that we built it that way is um, fantastic. Why is that not? Hopefully that comes back in a moment. Anyone else having problems on the internet? It's probably going to. The previous presenter also had a problem. It's probably going to ask you to log in. Okay. Go to like google.com in a tab. Right. There you go. Just put in any email address you want. I really want to get some spam from Kennesaw, so maybe, <laughs> maybe that would be good. So, so what I'm going to show, I'm going to show a demonstration from an actual project that we uh, we have developed, um, and you know this project is. Um, uh, let's see. So this is an actual live project that we've we've built. So in this project, I need to have, I need to be able to add um, products to a page. You know, this company has products. Uh, they need to add them. There needs to be some fields on there. We need to have, you know, like there's an image, there's some videos. Uh, you know, these are broken up into different content, uh, not content fields on the on the content type. Um, so how how do we do this? So um, I'm a project manager. I'm going to write a ticket. Uh, you know, I'm going to give you some screenshots, and I'm going to say uh, something that is not usually very related to the code you're actually going to write. Like many project managers I see don't actually say, you know, node title. You know, these are the fields I want. You know, use a body widget. Use a phone widget. Um, you know, it's very generic language. So what we uh, discovered, we discovered a tool called Bahat. And what Bahat is, Bahat is a testing framework. Um, it's based off of, came from the Ruby world, Cucumber. And Bahat has very English-like features. So 
Um, when now this is a pilot project, I don't have all the project managers on this. So when Uh, this is a project that I manage, so when I was writing this, I worked with uh, developers. So the kind of things I write to explain to the developer what I want to do is I say, what feature is this? I want to create some products, right? I have a role that I want to be, uh, and I want to be able to create products. This is all English text. The, the code doesn't interpret this at all. Uh, this is for humans. What the code does... Or you bring by the does the uh, What it does do is it let me say... Uh, uh, when we get into here, this starts saying catalog manager. So there's actually a piece of code on the back end that Behat has to know what catalog manager means. So just running Behat... Uh, one of the cool things about Bahat is you can write stories and not have any code behind it at all. And for a Drupal, if you're using the Drupal extension, um, it knows how to drive around Drupal. There are stories for like logging in. It doesn't know what a role that you create is, uh, but it does know how to get around Drupal. And the cool thing about when we run Bahat is it's going to... Um, it's going to tell us what features we need to define. So you can write a story, have no code behind for Bahat, and it'll let you know like if something fails, which is what you're trying to do. So I can specify down to, you know, I need to go to the admin interface. I'm going to create a product. I'm going to fill in uh, these fields. You know, this this is my label. That's what it is. Um, can you blow that screen up a little bit? It's hard to read. Uh, uh, is it better? Yeah. Okay. Can you move it up? Move the text up on there. Uh, yep. Maybe a bit bigger. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. Are you, are you one of my clients? <laughs> you make the logo bigger? Yeah. <laughs> Do you have a picture of your dog you would like on here? Um, can, can you read this now? Uh, so what I start getting is I start getting... Um, you know, this is very English-like. You know, I like to say it's so simple a project manager can get it. You know, so like the project manager team, we're writing stories. I am on a page and I fill in X. As an example, I'm going to fill in specific text. Um, you know, so... Uh, I have test fields that I can put into the product. Um, I can, uh, now this is something that we do, is we've written a custom, um, a custom token here that lets me write all these and when I am actually developing the project, uh, we would like to have a complete set of Bahat tests I know that they're not all going to pass, but I want to be able to know that uh, the stories that I, I have assigned are passing. So we actually created a, stip, a skip tag that lets the code skip over um, fields that are not yet implemented. But you can specify, you can see, you know, down to, you know, a pretty low level, what does, um, what do these tests do? Hmm. So and that's actually the syntax. The only the only required requirements there are the um, given and then, but um, everything else is, is the syntax of what's called Gherkin, which is what these are written in. Okay. And with with Gherkin, you know what they they've really done is they've tried to make this like really simple. Of you know we were looking at that page. You know we want to know there's a Vimeo video on there. You know we want to know what happens when we press a submit button. When we started out, I had maybe 50 lines. Uh, the entire test for this project runs, um, is about 4,000 lines at the end. 
Um, <coughs> so, you know that, that Excel sheet I was talking about that we're checking off all the items on? Uh, we got about, let me, let me kind of run through this because we're going to run out. This, I always run over on this project. Um, so what happens is, is we have two things on our tool selection. We've selected GitHub and we selected Travis because GitHub um, plugs into Travis or Travis plugs into GitHub, the integration is very nice. So every time a pull request is committed on the build, this will tell me, uh, you know, did this succeed? So here's one that succeeded, here's an item that failed. It goes to Travis, and at Travis, What runs in the uh, command line is, why is that not, you guys can, okay, here we go. Is that better to read? All right, so what starts happening? You know, this tells me all of the items that are set up, and this starts running all of those tests. Now the cool thing is these tests run for every single Bahat test written on the project. Every, every single time there is a commit on this branch. So, um, you know, here's one that failed. Uh, so this this ticket actually has to do something with a date of birth validation. It's changing some of the fields on the um, on the user object. So this is telling me, uh, oh no, this is in the checkout flow. So this is telling me that in the billing region, you know, this has failed. So you know that's that's nice, and that gives a project manager a good view into the project uh, as. A developer, you know, I talked about us having this on my box, and I'm not sure how to increase the size. Anyone know how to increase the font size in iTerm? All right, so I'm in the project. Um, so, you know, I was telling you that like, we have automated builds, so our projects are actually built one level up from the Drupal root. So in here I have the configuration for my Bahat. Uh, we're using Composer to manage some projects, and my, uh, the actual Drupal root is down in the www folder because we have a layer of, of automation above there. So before we were looking at the add product feature, if I am a developer on my local machine and I want to see, first of all, I can just run by hat and I can run all of those tests before I ever commit this up to the main branch. It empowers the developer to have their code tested before you push up. Uh, and that's really great. Right. Like right now, I am running this on my machine. You know, this is, you know, it gives me output of that entire feature that I had before. It takes a little bit to run. Uh, an entire test will take probably 15 minutes on this project. You know, but this gives me every scenario that this has ran through. It will also give me um, any time that I fail. So what I would do is if I were taking a, uh, a new uh, feature that I was having the developer develop, develop I'm going to take out the skip tag and I'm going to say you develop this feature. When you've satisfied the Bahat test, your code passes. So that is really the way we're working on communicating project managers to developers is update my Bahat test. Because your, your Bahat test basically defines the right. functionality you're expecting right. when that's is, is there a state that the uh, the website is in. Are, are you testing on the server side and the rendered HTML page, or uh, kind of? Um, okay, so a lot of moving pieces. Uh, Bahat is using. In our case, we're using Phantom JS, which is a driver for WebKit. 
So it's actually opening up a browser, connecting to the instance of Drupal that is on my local machine and running the test through just like someone was was clicking through the, the individual pieces on, on the page. Uh, there is a part of this automation that we don't have or that I, I don't think there is a solution for yet. I would love to know if anyone has something that validates uh, the appearance portion of the site. You know, so like uh, the hat will do great uh, validating that a field is on a page. If you've made a CSS goof and you've moved that field somewhere else on the page, that's harder to catch. We haven't gotten that far yet. Well, you have to look at it. Like, I, I would love something that would say, you know, I'm looking at it at this resolution and the fields are ordered this way. You could write the code. It's just, you know, you could go look for the specific divs, you know, and, and order the divs, but I haven't found that to be, like, a, a good payoff. Yes? We are piloting on large projects with a timeline. Um, I do find that it adds, from, from the estimate, I find that it adds something like 10% to the project. The thing that is, I, I want to say is that's from the estimate, and that means that, like, I think it's a little bit naive in the assumptions that we have been work our company has been working for before, that we would always have this unexpected bug testing phase when we got to UAT of going back. So it's, I, I'm on both sides of this argument. It's been an argument with management about this is something we need to do so that we can have defendable, predictable estimates. On some projects, not testing works great. On other projects, you know, it just goes to hell. Uh, you had a question. So, uh how, how long, I mean, how long is that testing script, and how big is that site? Uh, this, a right, little bit hard question to answer. The project is 2,400 hours, and the testing script is about 4,500 lines. And that's just BHAT? Uh, no, the BHAT test is about 4,000 lines. The the project we're testing, the Drupal project, is something like 2,300 hours. So in 20 minutes, I can test through that entire project. I'm not going to get everything. It's not going to test things that I haven't written a test for. So, you know, if you go rogue and you write a module and you don't write any BHAT test or I don't give a BHAT test to my developer to write the module to, it's not going to test that. We're, we're at right at 11 o'clock. I'm going to take questions, so... I don't want to get too much into there. Uh, I do want to, while we're doing this, I just want to put up, uh, and this will be in the slides, uh, of where to go for more information. So, go ahead. Uh, there was a question at the back, sir. Do you use uh, the hat exclusively <laughs> to manage user stories, or do you manage business requirements down to user stories elsewhere? Really good question. I don't have the perfect answer on that. We do get business requirement documents. I am really trying to get the behat stories written in the business requirements at the beginning. You know, as you know, like projects come in in all shapes, so like one's Ones that I have control over and I can shape that discussion, you know, my preference is, uh, even if it is a Bahat story that does not pass, is to write it as a Bahat story so that we can just sort of clean it up. Uh, if I let a business analyst do it, sometimes I get a big paragraph of stuff that is not really actionable from a development background. Yes. Yeah. You mentioned that you have integrations with like SOAP web services. Mm -hmm. Do you use something to mark them? Because obviously you're not going to have access to them on your local. So, how would you test 
know, if your page relies, like, like they had once, you, know, you have to pull the you know, triple instance right. the data from the web service on the back end, so if there's no data... I will mark a, I'll, I'll mark a response, and, or I'll mark what the... Um, what you're supposed to generate and say it has to generate oh, this. Or is it some kind of a framework for that? Um, like I said, it's not ideal. In this case, what we, for the project that we had that had the SOAP service, we would go make a valid SOAP call, copy the response, and then we would validate against what the site is generating for that specific call. Uh, it's a little bit arduous, but otherwise, um, so with integrations, the problem always is like it's firewalled, it's not available to every developer. So, uh, but the question is, if you don't do that, then how do you ever test that it works? So, uh, so, so there's no better way than just to put it in your code base and have like a switch, you know, uh, I'm using this stuff. There may be a better way. I'm, I'm open. I don't know it. We, we don't have it. This, as I'm saying, this is a work in progress. We're happy to collaborate. Uh, yes. Does this, does this uh, have become kind of hard to manage if the goalposts start changing a lot halfway through the project? Any project's hard to manage if the goalposts. <laughs> but I mean, now you're managing something else. Yeah, it's a, uh, it will make you push back much harder about Yes, that's a very good question. This is not at all like what you described before. Here's the exact thing you described. I think this is a change. Could we go get some more money for that or time? That's what I push back. Uh, it does, it does like really force you. You can't, so to get this backwards, like if you're, if you're changing requirements willy nilly and rapidly changing, it's, it's an issue. If you're changing at an atomic level, you know, like we were talking about those small commits earlier, smaller pieces, it's easier if you can pick out which one of those particular things you're changing. It will also tell you if you have good test coverage, it'll tell you if changing that small thing changed something else somewhere in the project. But um, yeah, changes in flight are, man, if we didn't have any of those, life would be great. Uh, for agile projects, we wind up writing. To me, like that's, that's a lot of, like you got four thousand lines of code in there. We didn't stop and we didn't write them all at once. But you know, remember, like every bit of that functionality, someone has to do. Someone has to specify it somewhere. So it's not like you weren't doing that work to begin with. You're just being explicit about it. You know, so like so, somewhere, someone had to write a ticket and say, you know, go build this content type. And somebody had to say, you know, these are the fields we have. So, I, I mean, I, you kind of saw the BHAT test. You know, I don't think they're any more cumbersome than any other way I have tried to specify, you know, you know giving you an Excel sheet and giving you columns and saying, hey, here's the content type, you know, here's the validation. Like, that's got to be done anyway. So uh, sometimes I will write the BHAT test as a stub at the top, uh, if it's an Agile project, especially, and not give the full detail, but it lets me know that a story needs to be written there. I mean, like, given I am on the products page, I will need to add project, pro uh, products. And I'll just write in English, like, here's the fields we know about, we don't know about these, and then put a skip tag on it. Just give me an idea, I don't know if this is something that's possible. Is, it, is there any way to integrate this with Assemblage or other system where you can either pull a user story or request from there into the system, or perhaps pull those, since they are plain English, into a requirements document summarizing it for the client so they can continuously see what you're seeing, and then you can modify perhaps otherwise by. So I'm saying, is there any kind of integration from I, I haven't done that. I mean, I'd love to see like something do that. The, the nice thing with, with the hat and, and the, um, the stories and the tests and the way that they're written is you can actually hand those tests to a client and they should be able to read them and, and understand them because they're written in plain English. They're not written in the PHP. So or, they're, they're very English-like statements. So they could potentially be incorporated into them. Well, the client we were working, we, um, we gave this to them as this is what we're doing for this print. This, this is our requirement. 
when, you know, when it does this, we're done. Um, UI was a different thing. So we're, we're about five minutes over. I want to make sure the next uh, speaker has time to present. Uh, I'll be up here for a few minutes. Oh, okay. Well, we need to eat. Okay, sorry. Uh, if you have questions, please contact me. I'll be around the rest of the day. Thank you. Thanks, man. It's really good. Thank you. Uh, I think it's really possible. Do I have any PHP scripts to read other PHP scripts? Yeah. So I'm wondering if you